uh, when we start looking at some of the work that we've done here in the shop, you'll see that we tend not to bind books in that sort of plain manner. And we don't, we don't bind them quickly and cheaply. That also means that the person you're binding them for has to sell them for some real money also. So it, well, or, or, or they have to be a collector or something like that or an right. institution. Exactly. And there are collectors we do work for who will pay um, what's necessary um, to get the job done. Um, but it is hard to meet those people. I think even with the internet, it still doesn't hurt, um, you know, going around and contacting people. One of the largest clients that we have had, um, I got a postcard from them, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I'm not sure when, uh -huh. advertising the kinds of books they did. So I did email them. I didn't send her a letter, but I did email them, letting them know we were here and saying, if you ever need a binder who can, you know, do interesting things with the books, let us know. Um, that led to a relationship that started about 15 years ago. And even though they are no, it's 21st editions, even though they are no longer doing books per se, we're now doing furniture with them, um, mm -hmm. boxes that um, really are you know, quite special boxes. Um, so, you know, still reaching out to people. I wouldn't necessarily sit back hoping stuff comes to you. Um, I think you do have to make concerted efforts mm -hmm. uh, to reach people. And in terms of artistic freedom of in, uh, in terms of choices, what to do, uh, who do you prefer to work for, for institutions, for publishers, or with uh, clients and collectors uh, directly? Where is, uh, where is there more of a dialogue between you and the client? That's something that grows. Um, I think when you're doing fine bindings or design bindings, um, the uh, clients coming to you because they've already seen your work, they sort of know how you work. Uh, there's, there are a number of fine binders. So if they don't like your work, they'll go talk to somebody else. So you can sort of make the assumption if they're coming to you, they're also coming in part because they want what you can do as opposed to what somebody else. It's not a question of quality. It's a question of style and artistic um, input. Um, I am fine with clients who come to me, like we've worked with publishers that come to us and present the design they want to use. I'm fine with that because we are a job shop as much as we are any other kind of shop as long as they allow us to do as good of a job as we can do, I'm fine to do their designs. Um, 21st editions, when we first started working with them, they had certain ideas in mind, but the first edition I did for them, I was able to talk them into letting me um, do the design for that binding and up until that point, binders they had been using, who were all very fine binders, just had not really offered them these kinds of options. You know, now it's become a thing with uh, 21st where it's a dialogue back and forth. And that happens with a lot of other, um, a lot of other clients as well. But still and, and still, not, not every uh, not every fine binder, not every binder is a design binder. It's it's uh, it's a bit of step for 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 a book binder to uh, start making design. I I'm not a design binder. I I can do I don't know leather binding, fine binding, but uh, I I'm not a designer, and uh, uh, it's it's always been hard for me to move uh, 
move forward to, to do something like that. And uh, so it's well, not- Stefan, you bring up an interesting thing about binding because I never saw myself, like early on in, in my career, when I was at Harcourt, um, and I was doing a lot of other work, I did um, start to get involved in um, exhibitions that the Guild of Book Workers was having. Um, there was somebody that had me, uh, a dealer who had me do some designs on um, bindings. And um, I did some, but then when the 80s, you know, midway through the 1980s, the market collapsed. And um, even some of the finest design binders, at least in this country, were having trouble getting work. Uh, the financial um, aspect of the country was really bad. And so that dried up and I stopped doing them. I didn't think of myself necessarily as a design binder. Um, and I have no training in design, even though I did work in printmaking. So I sort of thought of myself more as a job binder, but I've discovered over the years that you can train yourself in design. Um, and I think that's what some of us don't realize. Um, and it doesn't hurt if you can speak with somebody who does know design. Uh -huh. uh, I say like Don Gleister at the American Academy of Bookbinding, um, people like him, um, you know, you can, if you can talk with people like that, if you can look critically at the kinds of work other binders are turning out, I think you can start to understand what they're doing and you can, you can branch out beyond your own abilities. Now, some of us may never be really great design binders, I'm content if that's what is what my life is like, but I haven't gotten back to design binding in probably 20 years uh -huh. because I've been too busy trying to keep the shop moving. If I ever retire, I intend on doing that, but uh, we'll see if I get a chance to retire or not. As far as I understand, uh, it's it's also a sort of uh, it's a bit in French tradition of book binding when you have. Uh, a uh, separate, uh, separate master, separate professional for every step of binding. And yes. uh, they're very strict about uh, uh, keeping this order. And uh, uh, you really wouldn't know other uh, uh, elements of the process. Uh, you, are sp you are specialized in, in, uh, in something, uh, in a single process. And then you just uh, wouldn't share your secrets with anybody because, mm -hmm. uh, because they will take your job away from you. Right, right. Well, what watch trade used to be like that until comparatively recently. What trade? Um, uh, watch trade. Okay. Like uh, uh, the uh, a, fa a family used to make only one small part of the mechanism. Um, oh. uh, so imagine that, like like a hundred families making a single watch, but the yeah. color. But the result was uh, that uh, the techniques improved so uh, so fast. Because if you concentrate on one small part, you can make it more precisely, you can make it smaller, you can make it faster. So there are pros and cons. There, there are. I mean, when you look at uh, 19th century sort of Victorian leather bindings, um, they're nearly perfect um, because one person did the sewing, one person did the gilding, one person did all the leather work, one person did all the tooling, and then another person would put up the end sheets and do whatever finishing to the book was necessary. Um, you know, books that were so cleanly done you could eat off them. And then that's what, it's one of the issues that I face personally, it's also, I think one of the issues we may all face is that we look at that perfection and execution and think, why can't I do that? Well, that's the reason you can't do that. Um, there are some binders who can do that. Um, there's no doubt about that. The majority of us do something that is 
maybe a notch or two less than those Victorian bindings. And the Victorian bindings had issues with uh, longevity. Part of the reason the tooling is so crisp and beautiful in them is because the leather is paired so thin. Yeah. Um, when you sink a tool into a piece of leather that has some depth to it, you, it's not as easy to get such a crisp, beautiful um, tooling on that. Yeah. But then the boards will break off over time or the cords will get fans so thin when they're laced in, um, you know, there's just, there are problems with it. So I'm sure that you can strike a beautiful intermediary spot between that and something with longevity. And I don't mind if the hand shows in the book. I don't mind if there's evidence of this thing being done by hand. Not that I want it dirty and well done, but. Gold tooling is uh, definitely one of the processes that takes a lot of time to, to master and to, to, you know, to, to keep it uh, in working uh, order because it's like, like being a musician because you need to train all the time and you need to uh, keep your skills uh, in, in uh, well-oiled. Right, right, yes. And do you uh, uh, make your books all by yourself? Do you still uh, are you still active in all in uh, uh, in all the stages? You saw, you tool, you work with leather. Yes, um, I do. As I said earlier, I have um, uh, some employees. They're, they work about two thirds or three quarters of the week. Um, they're not in the shop. Today, in fact, since the pandemic, they really haven't been in the shop. They have their own shops in the same building, which is ideal because I can hand them work. They go off to their shop, do it, bring it back, and we go um, on like that. So I don't necessarily do every bit of a book. I don't sew that much anymore. Um, there's other things I need to do. I do all of the leather work. I do all of the gilding and I do all of the tooling. But then we don't turn out a lot of books with gilding and tooling. We may turn out a lot of leather books um, and some of them may have aspects of that. I did um, an edition of 40, actually in the end it was 42, cloth bound books that I just finished that have full gilt edges. So that was over 120 edges that I had to do. Um, you know, and you can get to be halfway decent when you're doing that kind of work. It was also the paper on those edges was problematic. It was paper for inkjet printing and it's kind of soft and pulpy. Yeah. So trying to get a good edge on that was not easy and the first books I did were not as good as the last ones I did because I kept learning and improving ways to address that kind of paper. Um, so it was a good process to learn. So I can do all of those things, but you know, because I'm spread thin, I'm not a great tooler. I'm not a great gilder. Um, I'm pretty good with leather, but you know, it's it's rare that you get to do all of that stuff and do it well.